to this week's episode of the Camogie Report podcast brought to you by Tipperary Camogie TV. I'm Jerlene Canan and I'm delighted to be joined by Thomas Conway, a journalist with Danina Gargin, uh, for my guest this week on the show. Thomas, you're very welcome to the show. Thanks, Jerlene. Thank you very much. Happy to be here. Good stuff. Um, so I suppose the FBD Insurance Senior Championship is in full swing at the moment. And I know you were at the Burgess to Hara and Silvermines game at the weekend on Saturday. Um, so a big win for Burgess to Hara in, in the end, 217 to eight points. Um, I know the first quarter was probably close. And then after that, they seemed to storm ahead. Um, do you want to just tell us a bit about the game? Yeah, it, it was quite an interesting game to observe, really, because you had two teams, I suppose, on somewhat kind of different trajectories, as in Burgess had lost, you know, the previous week to Cashel. Uh, we'd almost put a strong Cashel team, you know, a couple of tip minors there. And then on the other hand, you'd Silver So they were, you know, they were clearly buzzing and kind of, um, you know, on the crest of almost having beaten Nina a rogue the previous week so you know two teams are on very different trajectories but you know no better team than Burgess Tuhara to 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 halt a young and ambitious side like the Mines you know it, it was a triumph I think of, of experience and class uh, which the Mines had now in fairness uh, I say youthful enthusiasm and they are what struck me was they're, they're hugely energetic young side and and that was you know, it was evident in the first quarter and, and they pinned Burgess down in the first quarter and kept with them. But I suppose as the game progressed, I, I think because of maybe the calibre of um, some of the Burgess players and their level of experience, that kind of allowed them to, to surge ahead. And, you know, if you want to single out a player in particular, it's going to be Tari or um, Amy Kennedy because in that second quarter, like she wasn't particularly um, prominent throughout the rest of the game, but she seemed to kind of just breeze in that second quarter and just put on an absolute exhibition. And, you know, working off Jenny Grace, Jenny Grace was was influential right throughout the game. And But really, it was Amy Kennedy in that second quarter who won the game for Burgess. And, uh, and you know, once they, they, had, they were significantly ahead at half time. And it, what struck me in the second half was I think they just decided to to sit back and absorb the the silver mines pressure. Silver mines probably you know dominated more possession in the second, but you know failed to capitalise on it, failed to to score. Burgess were just happy to, as I say, absorb that pressure and you know and consolidate the back in numbers. And then every so often they break up the field in a counter attack. So you know in the end. You know, quite a, a refined performance from Burgess. Uh, Silvermine still will take positives from it. They're a coming side. Yeah, I just I was knowing, I was following your uh, Twitter updates and you, you were praising Amy Kennedy. She 2 4 score from play um, by half time. Um, did, you know, I think she was corner forward. Did she, did, was, did she play uh, a normal corner forward or did she roam out or did, Bur or did, Silvermine just interest to know, did they switch any different defender on her? Or Yeah, you, you see, it, it, it's almost like they tried to track her all right. She started in corner forward. That was where she was listed. But really, she just roved around the entire forward line, you know, the, the full forward line and the half forward line. And uh, as sure as hell, you know, Silvermine's tried to track her uh, and tag her. But of course, you know, you tag her and that, the next thing that opens up space for others. Um, and when you've the likes of Jenny Grace there, you know, they were also struggling to, to marshal Jenny Grace. And I think the two of them form a, you know, they're a really formidable partnership. If, if you want to, you know, if you want to beat Burgess, um, you know, the, the secret to beating them lies in those two. And that's not a... Um, you know that's fairly obvious, but they both play off one another. Um, as in, you know, Amy Kennedy's kind of this, you know, mercurial forward, huge pace, really skillful, and Jenny then is equally skillful, but she kind of plays a different game. She's able to hold the center, um, and she's able to bring in the players around her. She she has, you know, she has superb vision, and when you have someone like um 
someone of the caliber of Amy Kennedy who poses that kind of threat, um, it, it's almost it's almost impossible to stop her because either, either I, I actually think the the best way to to mitigate her is to almost adopt a zonal defense, as in there's almost no point trying to track Amy Kennedy around the field, like a little bit like. You know, like we see in Gaelic football, um, you know, we saw it with some of the, the Tyrone players and the Mayo players in the All-Ireland final. You know, if you if you play your, if you command an area of the field as a defender, that's nearly the best way to um, uh, to nullify a really powerful forward line, like the one which Burgess had. Uh, so that was probably a, a slight mistake until, you know, the credit has to go to Burgess. Uh, and how they, um, you know, how accurate and clinical they were up front. So you've, you've pinpointed a few key forwards there for Burgess. Um, for the opposition then, Silvermines, um, I see Sarah Madden popped up with a few points, uh, Bree Quinn. Is there anyone that caught your eye in particular? Yeah, obviously those two were, were very influential and they kind of, in fairness to Sarah Madden, you know, and the game had probably... You know, the game had faded away kind of uh, a couple of minutes after half time. It was quite clear Burgess, you know, uh, had command of this. But in fairness to Sarah Madden, she, she really did stand up and she kind of, she led the charge. And Silver Mines didn't, you know, you'd have to admire them. They, they didn't relent. I mean, they could have kind of thrown in the towel and, you know, midway through the second half. But they really did attack ferociously. Now, they couldn't, as I say, capitalise on it. But it, it, it was Sarah Madden, Bree Quinn. Nicola Butler, um, the other wing forward, was also quite quite prominent. She, she's well able to field a high ball. Uh, and that's a real asset if you have, you know, because it gives you an option from the puck out, um, obviously, to go long. Uh, and, you know, I talked about the Burgess forward line with their pace going short can 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 be quite dangerous. Um, so you know she was uh, she was another player I'd rate. Um, the Murphys uh, maybe didn't have their best day at the office, um, but you know, and I'll I'll put my hand up. I, I'm kind of half related to them, but there's no uh, there's no nepotism here, or um, well, I am related to them. There's no nepotism or family favoritism, but we know they're you know, a high caliber of player and similarly the Cunnings. Um, and maybe they didn't get the, uh, the Cunnings didn't get the ball up front to, to do the damage that they could. Um, but I, I, I would think those players will mature. Uh, I think there's, they have a little bit to go yet. Um, but I think Silvermore has made a breakthrough in, in beating Nina last week. And, you know, they look to, they look to build on that again. The worst thing they can do is, I think, read, Obviously, they have to learn lessons from this Burgess game, but you know, reading into it too much can can kind of be dispiriting because um, you know they put a lot into their performance, and a couple of small tweaks in their game, I think, could go a long way to improving them. Yeah, I think I think what we've seen so far in this year's championship in both groups, I suppose, is to not read too much into any particular result, especially the first round games. Um, you know, Cashel had a good win over Burgess Duhara the first day out. Uh, I think it was 212 to 1 6. But to see Burgess Duhara put up 217, and like you said, you know, they weren't even firing all cylinders there in the second half. Um, the, the spine of the team against Silvermind, you know, the, the back line there, Gemma Grace, the full back, Piedmar, centre back, that, that looks very impressive. And I, I'd imagine Silvermind's found that hard to break down. It, it is. And I mean, when you have, when you have players as solid and as as skillful as um, as Gemma and uh, and Quiva and, and Quiva is particularly like we all know she's a she's a top quality player, but you know her vision is is, is top class. She's able to spray the ball from centre back, um, in a way which, which you know she uses the ball so intelligently, um, that that creates a, a a further dilemma if you're. If you're on the silver mines back line, because you know invariably uh, Quia will choose the right option, and you know both her sisters um, are uh, you know are superb hurlers as well, and you know all very athletic, uh, all of huge pace, and and those are all the attributes of a um, 
you know, of key players. So, and there's one other thing, actually, you know, now that I mentioned about Burgess, um, and it's crucial, I think, they know how to win. As in, you know, their club has a culture because of the successes, the, the remarkable success over the past couple of years, serial county champions, two monsters, you should really have an All-Ireland title, unlucky not to have one. Um, but that culture of winning is there, a little bit like, you know, a little bit like Kilkenny. Um, you know, we remember Cody, you know, coming out of that golden era, um, say the Kilkenny team, like if you play Kilkenny, you know uh, the Kilkenny hurlers, similarly the Kilkenny, Cork, Galway, Camogie teams, you know, they know they can win because they've been to the well and they've performed at that level. And, and when you have that psychologically, uh, it is a major advantage in contrast to maybe a team like Silvermines who will go on and achieve and, and have um, have potential to do that, but maybe haven't yet um, broken that seal uh, even to, to, you know, win one big title ca can open a lot of doors. Uh, and I think that's a that's a significant, you have to factor in that psychological aspect, um, you know, to playing teams like that. That's why Burgess will always feature at, at the latter stage of the championship, even if their team isn't maybe what it was. Um, but that said, it's still a very strong team. And I'd expect them to, uh, you know, to, you know, to go far in this year's championship. Yeah, I think that point is very relevant. We had Sabrina Larkin from Shan Rovers on last week and just talking about the different results and talking about Kasha beating Birds to Hara. And, you know, I think she made a comment like, you know, they won't worry about that, you know, coming into this game this weekend. And and what you, seeing the result and hearing what you're saying there, I think I see what she meant now. Like, they'll just park that defeat against Kilkash and move on, you know, know that... I suppose history that they would always be stronger in silver mines. And while some of us were wondering, could silver mines catch them and beat them? I don't think maybe Birds to Hara ever doubted. I think they believed that if they turned up and played, you know, they would want win. And it looked that way. And um, just looking ahead to this weekend, um, Burgess are at home to Nina and Cashel. Silver Mines then are away to Cashel. How how would you see them two games going? Both of them now. Both of them are, are, are intriguing because obviously Nina, I, I would expect Burgess to overcome Nina based on, you know, based on form and, and analysis of the previous games. But Nina will be absolutely gunning um, to, you know, to get a bit of vengeance and to, to atone for that, um, you know, for that defeat, Silvermines. And, and they really want to, um, to put in a big performance this weekend. And, and, and they have... You know they they have the players to do that, um, but uh, I'm not sure they have enough in them to to overcome Burgess. Particularly now, you you got a sense the last day that Burgess have have found found their feet. They're back on track now, um, and they've kind of you know that initial performance maybe there there was a sense that you know it, that can happen a team at times. But as as you alluded to there, um, you know they put that in the past, and I think the only way is upwards for, for the foreseeable future. The other game, uh, the other game will be a real, a really fascinating battle. I mean, I think this now, this is the test for Silver Mines. This is, you know, can they bring it up to the next level? Uh, because beating Nina Rogue was, was a, was a big win. And there's no doubt about that. And there's no doubt that there is, uh, you know, droves of potential in that team. Uh, but it will be a real kind of uh, character test as much as anything else now to see can they uh, can they pull one over Cashel? Um, and I would say, and you know I, I would emphasize it's not the end of the world if they don't. I think what you know what their management team will be looking at is a performance. you know they have the likes of Mark Jennery in the sideline. he's very astute, you know and uh, a good tactician that they'll they should set up in the right way. They'll know the strengths which Cash will have. But they're and, still, and, and, you know, they're still a very strong team. And even even though they weren't playing at the weekend, they had a boy. Um, their minor team was out, and a lot of that, a lot of the Cash minor team uh, are on the senior team. So they had a good win at the weekend over over Nakavilla. So you know, they're they're definitely an up and coming side and full of confidence. They, they are, and I think actually what what's really interesting about this one 
uh, they're probably both, you know, they're similarly a very young age profile and, and they have, you know, similarly they have loads of energy and loads of pace. So it'll be interesting to see how they look against the minds. Um, because there are two teams probably who play a relatively similar style. Um, and it should be a really, it should be a real battle. And I'd expect it to be a real kind of frenetic game, you know, a, a frenzy of, of scores and, and you'd expect goals um, knowing the, uh, the type of players that both teams have uh, just saying, on a couple of occasions. Well, hopefully they will, you know, because they'll certainly, it, it would be an entertaining game if, if you have to go on, yeah? No, just saying, looking at the other group then, um, Anna Carty had a great win over Clonaunty, 3-13 to 1-14, um, while Drummond Lynch had a very comprehensive win over Tumi Vara, a big scoreline there, 328 to three points. So very disappointing for Tumi Vara, but I suppose they were short a few players through injury and even they lost the player in the warm-up through injury. So nothing going their way there. But I suppose Danny Carty and Clonaunty result was definitely an interesting one and um, it makes that group all to play for. Uh, Drum have beaten Clonaunty. Clonaunty have beaten Turles. Turles have beaten Anacarty. And now Anacarty have beaten Clonaunty. So uh, that group is really, you know, very very intriguing group as well i don't know have you been keeping an eye on, on the results over that group yeah no I, I certainly have and and it's completely wide open uh you know i, I had kind of done a fair bit of research into into a lot of these teams you know prior to the championship beginning I was doing a preview piece um and kind of made a number of predictions and you know so far, it's just been so unpredictable, which which actually is great because it signals how competitive uh, the Tip Championship ha has become. Um, and you know, it, it, you know, if you were negative, you could say teams are quite volatile. But really, I think it's more to do with with uh, clubs producing big performances. Now, what will be interesting to see is when when things kind of level out, and um, you know, when you take it over the course of the season usually the best teams will will have that consistency. Sometimes you see early in a championship um, uh, surprising results can occur um, because teams, some teams are full of energy and, and you know, they're full of energy, enthusiasm, ambition. Um, but the the more experienced sides like the Drum and Inch, Clonality, uh, Burgess are kind of able to, uh, to, to, temper that to kind of approach it in a bit more composed manner um, and over the course of the season then they'll improve so you know it, it'll be interesting to see which way it goes and um, certainly yeah at group one or, or group a or whatever uh, you want to call it is is a fascinating and it, it's a fast some of those games are will be uh will be really intriguing this weekend um and, and should be enjoyable i think you know which is a huge uh Huge bonus for Tip, tip Komogi. Like a, you'd encourage anyone to, you know, pick your game and go to it because, it, you know, you should be guaranteed a high quality of, of Komogi and a high degree of entertainment as well. Yeah, I definitely agree with you there. So, Thomas, just to finish up, I'll put you on the spot now. One word answer, just looking for your predictions for the weekend and uh, in the FBD Insurance Senior Championship. All these games happening on Saturday. Uh, so first of all, to pick a winner, Turles and Tumi Vara. I have connections to Tumi Vara. They they won't like me for saying this, but I'm going to go with Turles. Anna Carty and Drummond Inge. I think Drummond Inge will come out there. Yeah. Uh, Burgess and Nina. Burgess. Cashel and Silvermines. I'm going to go with Cashel. I, I, I've talked up silver mines, but I'm going to go with cash. So you're predicting Turles and our drum and inch, uh, Burj Duhara and Cash. We'll keep an eye on that and uh, we'll see how your predictions work out. Uh, Thomas, thanks a million for coming on, chatting to us today. Um, and sure, we'll be in touch again maybe throughout the, throughout the year and uh, looking forward to more, more exciting games and, and match reports from yourself and with Anina Garrett. And thanks very much for joining us on the Camogie Report podcast. Absolute pleasure. Thanks a million. Okay, my next guest on today's podcast is Grainne O'Leary, a Camogie Development Officer with Tiberi County Board. Grainne, you're very welcome to the show. Thanks very much, Ger. Um, I suppose, work? firstly, Grainne, to those who wouldn't be familiar with the role of the Development Officer, 
Do you want to give us a brief outline of, of the work you do and projects and initiatives you're involved with? Yeah, I suppose, look, I suppose development is in the name really, and really in terms of Camogie, it's about trying to develop our game um, from the under sixes right up to adulthood in clubs and county. Um, and it's all about coaching, you know, trying to develop coaching, um, improve coaching, and that in turn um, helps the development of players at club level and at county level. And I suppose we can put in a lot of different initiatives behind that um, in terms of, you know, you're running all your underage blitzes um, for the for the younger ones, sixes, eights and tens. Then you're running your leagues for, you know, under 12s, 13s, 15s. You know, we do summer camps. Um, we ran one this year for under 15s, which was, you know, again, it's another age group where skills are very important. And it was a fairly technical uh, camp, a lot of good coaches in there. So I suppose it's developed at every turn, you know, and you're putting in maybe under 17, under 19 leagues, seven asides. And really it's about improving skills for girls and improving coaching. And, and also it's about retention of players, you know, because we don't try to put in initiatives. You know, you lose girls and we lose a lot of girls sometimes from Camogie and females from sport in general. So, you know, it is very important that we try to stay on top of those things. Another part of the role here is um, the overseeing of the county development squad at under 14 and under 15. And I suppose this year we're very fortunate. The girls got a, a great, a fantastic run, got to wear the tip jersey um, seven or eight times because we had Munster Blitzes and we had All-Ireland uh, Round Robins and an All-Ireland Final Day. And we had three under 14 development squads um, and we had two under 15. So, you know, they did really, really well and they've been going right through and they just finished up there last week. And I suppose another important role that we, we do in development is, is, is development coaching in schools. You know, we, every, in September, we, there's a Munster Development Grant and we're involved in six or eight schools um, for the first term. And then we do another four into the second term. So if your school, if your club um, requests that, we get involved school and the club, then once the school club link. Yeah, amazing amount of work you're doing. Um, I suppose it, there's a committee or kind of a team there as well, is it? Or how does it work? Or? Yeah. No, we have a we have a development group, a very hard working committee. There's eight of eight of us on the group, which you know, in fairness, and everybody has their own role, kind of within that group. You know, in terms of one person takes the blitzes for the under eights and tens, another person takes the twelves. Two people take the twelves, um, and so on and so forth. But like we work together closely. Great working committee there. Brilliant, yeah. Loads of work being done in development in Camogie the last few years. It's very evident. Um, if you're following it at all, all the all the different things that is going on. Um, I suppose the big thing I noticed the last few weekends and was involved with my own club, Drum and Inch, was um the under twelve county finals. Um, there's been loads of county finals, loads of semi finals. We've had loads of excitement, massive crowds at the games, and I suppose just to see all the different clubs and teams getting to play in county finals and getting to celebrate. And if just explain to us how, I suppose, the structure of the under-12 competition worked and um, sort of what's the benefit of the structure? Right, I suppose, look, um, I suppose it goes back to about three years ago where this kind of idea came from, you know, where we had three, four years ago, we had a lot of clubs with big numbers, but, you know, there was, they were putting in one team so a lot of girls weren't getting to play full games, you know, and I would have observed this because I was with the you know, under-12s in my own club at the time. And so we kind of thought about it. And then clubs started putting in second teams, but they were sometimes coming up against first teams, you know, and physically that's not good, you know, a 12-year-old versus kind of a 10-year-old, 10 and a half year old The physical physicality as well as the development stage that players are at, you know, you have girls that are, you know, girls players develop at different ages and obviously a 10 year old is at a very different stage in their development to a 12 year old so it's a bit of a mixed match and so I suppose that year we observed that and you know it left a lot of girls deflated a lot of girls didn't get game time and so on so we kind of had to look and see what we could do about it so we decided to kind of run an under 12 league but with a difference that if you had a second team it was going to be a second tier competition in terms of they would only play a second team, you know, which it's a, a level playing field then. So you had girls of the same ability playing in that group. So 
the first year we had about 10 second teams along with obviously the 30 um, first teams, which was great. And you know, it ran really, really well, lots of games. We put it in as a Celtic challenge type format. So I suppose that's again, a little bit different to what we would have been used to. The traditional kind of grading is what we were all used to. But I suppose it's very difficult to grade in under 12. And I think girls should be just allowed to play, you know, and no grading and wherever, wherever they finish, that's kind of where they should sit. So groups of 10, so you play nine games and wherever you finish, whether you win three games, win four games, win nine games, you'll have a spot. So you'll either be one to 10 somewhere along the line. And in Tipperary, we have four, we have two first team groups in the north, two in the south. So you would have had, you had four, let's say number ones, four number eights and so on. And that was your semi-final pairings. Um, and that means complete level playing field by the time you get to semi-final stage. And I suppose just to fast forward then, 12 months later, the second year we had 15 second teams and 32 first teams. And then this year, which is year three of it, um, we actually ended up being 22 second teams. So nearly every club in the county is putting in a second under 12 team. So I suppose the system works because by the time you get to your semi-final stage, you meet your level and you know, as, as you alluded there to a few minutes ago, the last couple of weekends, has, it has been our semi-final and final weekend. And there's been, you know, a festival type atmosphere for all the world. Um, in Clannauty a couple of weeks ago with 15 games, there wasn't a poke of the ball between any team. You know, it was like every match was in all Ireland for those girls. Parishes came out in droves to support their young people. You know, it's actually, it's a joy to watch. And the same again this weekend in Borlan. And we had again in, in the Camogie field, we've had them in Ballycal, you know, all over the county for the month of September. Like there's really huge entertainment, value for money for all these games. And, you know, the advantage of all the games, you know, is it develops players, you know, they start out in in March, April training and they go the whole way to September and they pretty much have a game a week, training session a game a week, you know. In lots of ways, you know, as someone said to me in my own club, the girls have no choice but to develop because they're playing so many games, you know, and they can work on the skill, a train, and then use it in the match at the following weekend, you know. So, and then I suppose the other benefits are for clubs, you know, every club gets into a county final at under 12, you know. There's clubs out there that may not have gone into an under 12 county final for years until this system came into play. And, you know, if you lose your semi final, you still go into a shield final. So, there's a lot of kudos that goes with that, you know. If you think of the last couple of Fridays, you know, you had like 15, 20 clubs, excitement, that amount of girls, 400 odd girls facing into a county final that weekend. You know, what that does in schools and, you know, for camogie in schools, there's a whole hype about it uh, around the clubs, around parishes. You know, you just can't beat it like. And, you know, we've had that kind of palpable excitement every weekend for the whole month of September with the under 12 leagues, you know. Yeah, it's been brilliant. And like you said, every, every, under 12 girl in the county gets to play in the county final and and that's massive and you know all the family are excited and get behind and getting out and supporting them and um, it's really good so so that's a that's some stuff that you, 22 of the clubs had a second team as well how many yeah. clubs are, are, have we in Tipperary at the moment we with 36 clubs uh, 36 yeah so like there's been an incremental incremental increase in girls playing under 12 about 27 percent year on year um uh, for the last four years, like, and it was yeah. The good thing as well is we're retaining these players, and the reason we're retaining them into thirteen and fourteen is because of all the game time they're getting at under twelve. You know, it, ability doesn't really matter at under twelve because they will all improve and develop further because they're getting the opportunity to play all these games. You know, and yeah. even the you know the ten year old and the eleven year old that are playing, you know, it it, it makes them in gives them huge scope for the following year you know they get used to playing on a big field um, and getting all that game time which they wouldn't just get um, at under 10 or you know if the club only puts in one team they wouldn't get that because obviously you have to play all your players at under 12 so they're only getting half a match and you know that's not really good enough for for that player's development for the club so you know we encourage clubs to put in the second team we've even reduced down the numbers a little bit to nine aside even eight yeah. aside, 
last year in COVID, you know, because we weren't sure some players might come back, you know, and that's just to encourage and to make it to make more clubs able, I suppose, you know, to allow more clubs to to um put in that second team. Very good. Yeah, look, a uh, credit to, to you and, and all the committee, it's huge work involved in organising all that and it definitely has been a great success again this year and the under-12 uh, leagues. Um, I suppose moving from the under-12s, it's a big weekend this weekend for the under-8s and 10s in the county. Uh, on Sunday is the Festival of Camogie. Um, it's a, an under-8 and an under-10 county blitz in Dr. Morris Park, isn't that right? That's right, um, Jerry. Yeah. Look, we haven't been able to do this for three years because um, obviously with the, the COVID situation, um, but Tesco uh, came on board earlier this year nationally and they want to sponsor Festival of Camogie um, for counties. So it's up to each county what we wanted to do. So I suppose we've run these big blitzes in Borsali in the past and hugely successful, like girls absolutely love it in clubs. So we decided for our Festival of Camogie, we'd do it with the under eights and under tens. So, you know, we're all super excited about Dr. Morris on, on Sunday because it'll be the first time we've been able to have this type of big blitz in a number of years. Um, so we have, I think, we have like 42 under eight teams coming on uh, Sunday morning and they're all going to kick off at about half nine. And I suppose we want a festival atmosphere there. So we're going to have um, pipers and we want, uh, we're going to do a, a parade around the field and we're going to have some photographers there and we want to see all the colour and all the club banners and the jerseys, you know, it'll be, it'll be a sight to behold, you know, and then we'll kick off with games. So, you know, we'll have, we'll have teams from the South playing some of the Northern teams that they wouldn't have got the opportunity to do this year, you know, and I suppose also the whole thing, Dr. Morris, you know, lots of young girls see maybe people, older girls in the clubs going up to development training or to county training and, you know, it'll be lovely and they're all excited about that. Uh, going up to Dr. Morris themselves, you know, to play on it. So, you know, and they, a lot of girls know about from going into Simple Stadium to see matches and, you know, passing off Dr. Morris on the way. So, you know, it'll, it'll be a great morning. And then in the afternoon, we're going with the under 10s. And again, I think we've like 40 odd teams coming um, for the under 10 competition in the afternoon. So, you know, we hope to have a few uh, surprise visitors there with some photo opportunities as well. Um, and we'll have KB Sports are going to be there and we're going to have, you know, some shops there, some tea and coffee and stuff for all the parents as well. So, Brilliant. Yeah. So it's not all camogie, there's a, lots, lots of other things going on as well outside of the, of the, of the brilliant camogie, obviously. Yeah, exactly. You know, so there'll be something for everybody there, you know, so, and that's the whole idea. Like it is, we want it to be a really enjoyable, fun day out for, you know, for, for all, obviously all the girls, but all the clubs as well. And, you know, the mentors and the families, you know, and, mum and dad or nanny can come along and have a cup of tea and watch the matches and you know as I say there will be some hopefully surprise guests there and loads of photo opportunities uh, for, the, for the morning and throughout the day Brilliant, sounds brilliant sounds really exciting and I'm sure no doubt it's going to be another great day in the Camogie calendar um, so finally Grani, before I let you go um, just I suppose aside from the big blitz this weekend What's the, rest of the, what's the rest of the year looking like for, for uh, Camogie development in Tipperary? I know, I suppose, a lot of, um, especially juvenile teams, will be winding down and people will be looking to put the feet up over the winter, but it's, it's probably a, probably an even busier time for, uh, for, for the likes of you and, and your group uh, with uh, academies and workshops and things like that. Yeah, I suppose uh, we're not winding down any for the moment there. Um, I suppose, firstly... The clubs won't, we're not the clubs aren't winding down either um, because uh, we've uh, put in an under 13 and an under 15 development league for the clubs and we're delighted that 28 clubs are entering both competitions you know we feel they're these are very important you know they're a link between 12 and 14 with the 13 and you know it's a whole new team you know you have some under 12 some under 14 so clubs really buy into it you know so they get new management in and it's a new team so you know it gives clubs kind of a, a, a renewed interest for the next six, eight weeks. And it keeps the girls playing camogie, you know, help with their development. And again, it'll keep more girls playing. And it's same with 15, you know, it's kind of the gap here between uh, 14 and 16. And again, new team. So it gives management the idea that they can play under six, you know, the idea for the under 16 teams for next year. So, you know, they're going to run from October and November. And, um, you know, please God, 
we, we'll get favourable weather. Um, and um, yeah, it should, it's going to be great for the clubs and for the girls. And we're delighted to have 28 clubs involved, which is phenomenal. Brilliant. And will there be co any plans for coaching workshops over? Yeah. So the other thing we're doing then is um, with, we're going to do running in an under 13 academy um, and under 14 development. So these are going to be run in Dr. Morris Park. We're going to start mid-October uh, with the under 13. But both of them are going to be run starting mid-October, one on Tuesday night and one on Thursday night. And all clubs are um, sending some girls down to that. So they're going to be ball wall sessions. We ran them a couple of years ago. Again, hugely successful. Um, you know, and girls really buy into it and helps with their development, obviously. And, you know, they can bring that back to their clubs as well. And with the under 13 academy, you know, what we'll be doing is that'll be part of that will be coach the coaches as well. You know, so we'll be inviting coaches from the clubs to come with their girls on the night and to observe for the six or eight nights, you know, so they can bring that expert coaching back to their clubs. And then the under 14 will run on the Tuesday nights. And again, that's probably, you know, we're looking, it'll be development for the six weeks, but the plan will be, you know, looking forward into 2022, um, which isn't too far away. And I suppose after the six weeks, we're hoping then if we get favorable weather into November that we'll start running, these girls will get to play some games uh, in their division, you know, so we might have the North versus the Mid and the South versus the West or whatever um, uh, for a couple of weekends into towards the end of um, November. And hopefully take a break maybe for December. Hopefully it'll be all wrapped up in time for Christmas. But that's the plan. So the break it's a busy couple of weeks. Yeah. <laughs> it, yeah, exactly, Jared. But look, it's a busy, busy couple of months ahead. But look, as I said at the outset, there's a fantastic working group there and huge enthusiasm within the group and, you know, for development. And, you know, development, I suppose, is at every turn. You know, last year we didn't get a chance to do as much as we would have liked to achieve. And, you know, we're always trying to plan for the following year to think what you can put into the calendar. You know, we did, we ran the 19 competition this year, as you know, I think uh, Drum, your own club, were, were involved with there and were successful in, which we hadn't been able to do in previous years. So that was a kind of a new initiative that we put in. And, you know, we'd hope to run more of them into 2022 as well, you know, so. Brilliant. It's Very exciting, Grania. And like you said, it's great. I suppose that COVID, please God, is behind us now. And, and there's, a, you know, it's much easier to organise things and to, to do all the great things and put into place all the ideas that you have. Um, fair play to Grania. Delighted to get you on to talk about all the work that you do. Um, it is, you know, it is unbelievable voluntary work for, from you and, and all your committee. And um, I suppose we're seeing the fruits of it in, in Tipperary. And like you said, the numbers alone playing Camogie um, is, is phenomenal. Like, as you can't believe it, 22 second teams in the under 12 competition. That's brilliant. And, um, you know, uh, actually, we're going to do a, a, a special podcast uh, broadcast from, from the Festival of Camogie on Sunday. So, We'll, we'll uh, that will be out next week, so everyone will get to see, um, you know, the great uh, skills on offer and all the fun and excitement that comes with that blitz. So really looking forward to that and uh, getting into watch that as well. So Brian, thanks very much for being my guest today and for telling us all about the work and your role as the Camogie Development Officer and uh, the ongoing development work in, in the county. And um, thanks very much. Thanks, Sharon. Thanks, William. Thanks to both my guests, Thomas and Grania, for joining us on the Camogie Report podcast this week. Um, just before we finish up, just a rundown of uh, last weekend's results. Uh, we've already gone through the senior uh, results. So the FBD, uh, FBD Insurance Junior B Championship wins for um, Carrick Swans over Ballingarry. Carrick Swans won six, Ballingarry seven points. Portro had a big win over St. Croix Ross Grey, 6-9 to no score. Gurtner Who, um, 11 points. McCarthy Burris, 2 13. The FBD Insurance Junior B, 2 Championship Care, 2 2. Holy Cross Valley Hall, 5 8. Silvermines, 1 16. Shan Rovers, 4 3. Toomey Vara, 1 6. Anna Carthy, 7 points. And then there was two, uh, one game in the FBD Insurance Minor A Championship. Um, Kasha beat Nakabilla, a goal and 16 points to 3 7. In the Minor C Championship, Kilowan McDonough, 5 6. Money Gall, 1 8. And Newport Van Hinge 616, Burge to Hara 1 4. So this weekend, then more fit, more games, um, another action packed weekend. The FBD Insurance Senior Championship all happening on Saturday, Turles and Tumivara. 
Anna Carty and Drummond Inch is 4.30, Burge to Hara Nina is 4.30, Cashel and Silvermines is 4 p.m. and Turles to Mivara is 4 p.m. as well. So just keep an eye on uh, Tipperary Camogie.com website and social media and clubs, various social medias for all those uh, venues and times. Um, and the FBD Intermediate Insurance, FBD Insurance Intermediate Championship, sorry, at 4 p.m. on Saturday, we have Shannon Rovers against Boris Lee, Naka Villa, Dunaski Kickhams against Kerr, and Kerouac McDonough's against Newport Ball and Hinch. Then on Sunday, October the 3rd, FBD Insurance Junior A Championship at 11 o'clock, Holy Cross versus Drummond Inch, and Killa Dangan versus Feathered. The FBD Insurance Junior B Championship at 11 o'clock on Sunday, McCarkey versus Portro and St. Cronin's versus Girton Who. And then the FBD Insurance Junior B2 Championship at 4 p.m. Uh, on Sunday, we have Silvermines versus Anna Carty, Brian Bruce versus Bally Bacon, and Holy Cross versus Cashel. So loads of games look forward to this weekend and uh, keep an eye on the social media for all the results throughout the weekend. If you enjoyed this week's podcast, don't forget to like and subscribe.